Hey gang, welcome back. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm still in the midst of this big project of doing uh, 42 illustrations for a book. I, I showed you some of my work yesterday. I'm going to work on this one in just a minute, but again, just to let you know, those of you who are new, where I'm, where I'm going. This is a list of the illustrations that I'm doing. Every once in a while, I will print out a reference. In this case, I needed a bird in that position, so I found that and printed it out. Uh, here's what the finished illustrations look like. Again, forgive me if you've been joining me. It's a fairly refined um, pen and ink technique. Um, simple pen and ink, that is to say, you know, mechanical, uh, not mechanical, not technical, but just these high-tech, uh, basically felt-tip pens. So that's what I'm using. I'm working on, again, marker paper. As I've said many times, because every pen and ink job, there needs it with every job, there needs to be a symbiosis between three things: the ink, the paper, and the pen. And and for you students who try to do some pen and ink and it's just not going well, the ink's not behaving right. Well, it's very, very possible. Now, in this case, it's very possible we have one of those three is not in sync. Now, of course, when you're using a pen like this, the ink and the pen come together. When I talk about uh Here's a real technical pen, if you will, a pitograph pen. Um, this kind of pen, which I still use a lot, you, you know, you refill the reservoir. So that's what I mean. Or a fountain pen. I've got a fountain pen right around here somewhere. Yeah, here we go. Again, here's a, here's a typical fountain pen that I use for art quite a bit because it gives me a more expressive line. And again, with this kind of pen you you are constantly refilling the reservoir so there needs to be again the point i want to make is the kind of ink the kind of pen and the kind of paper i mean once you find the magic formula of course you can just use the same three over and over and over and over of course but if you're like me you're always experimenting you're always trying something new uh you're learning new things so uh then with each new job you have to do what I did here, which is I went through a number of different brands of pens and several different kinds of paper before I discovered that, okay, these these two pens and this paper play well together. So there we go. Um, so that's what the final artwork looks like. Yesterday, I can't remember which of these illustrate. I did nine illustrations or nine sketches yesterday. One, two... Three. I know I'm not showing you these in detail. Four, five. So this one needs a little bit of work. Pull that one back out. Six. This one was fun because it's so different. It's not people. It's architecture, which of course I enjoy. Um, here's one that bears worth that, that's worth mentioning. Um, this is the only one that's a close-up of anatomy. So for that one, I took a picture of my daughter's arm and basically traced it. Right. Except. Uh, again, the, the danger in tracing, of course, is you turn off your brain. But as I said yesterday, my daughter, who I absolutely love to pieces, she's 36 years old, but she's very slight, so she's a good model for this for this woman. Um, she has hands. I, I when I looked at her hand, I said, "Golly, she's got my hands," and uh, and kind of her mom's hand too. My my wife is an excellent piano player, and she has really good piano player hands, and I have kind of working hands. Um, but my daughter inherited both of us. She doesn't have, she'll never be called on to be a hand model. <laughs> and by the way, my daughter is a really good guitar player. So there you go. She has really good guitar fingers. Um, so I had to modify her hand. I didn't just trace it. I, I smoothed it out. I turned it into a little bit more of a ballerina hand. Does that make sense to you? So there you go. But um, for anatomy up this close, you know, unless I'm like, uh, you know, a real anatomy full-time anatomy drawer like proko p-r-o-k-o -O. look him up by the way if, if you don't know my friend he doesn't know me for the man in the moon but i f i follow him on fa on uh, youtube p-r-o-k-o -O. prokopenko is his full name i think and I, I i love his stuff i just some his is some of the best stuff on the internet along with mark carter c-a-r-d-e-r -E and a bunch of other people but there are also some really bad artists on YouTube. It amazes me. And and not 
if if an artist has a lot of followers because they're cute and sexy, I'm a little suspicious, just between you and me. Uh, and there's a lot of those that are doing really, really bad artwork, in my humble opinion, uh, but they have a lot of followers. But at the same time, there are a lot of unbelievably good artists on, on YouTube. I, I just love that we, you know, I know there's all kinds of dangers about getting stuck on the internet, you know, stuck on face, social media, stuck on Facebook, Instagram, and so on and so forth. It's bad for our character personality who knows what it's doing to us but man i gotta tell you i love <laughs> and i'm not one of the kids right i love that we have all this amazing information at our fingertips okay so there's the rest of yesterday's sketches that's enough i, I think i did nine and i've only got three more sketches to go and i started working on i did this one just worked on this one for the second time just a few minutes ago fixed this bear yeah grabbed my phone looked up googled Black bear, mouth open. By the way, there's a lot of difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear. Now, this is not a grizzly. This is a black bear. So I googled black bear, mouth open, black bear standing, black bear paws. Those were all separate searches. Thank God for Google, right? And then, I, and then it turns out this young man is supposed to be sitting at the base of the tree, etc., etc. So make it, again, once again, as an illustrator. Hi, Ant, by the way. <laughs> Thanks for following me. Um, as, as an illustrator, it is my delight to create little movies. I mean, you know, I have to picture. So what does a young man look like who's being attacked by a bear? What does a bear look like? What does the girl in the tree who's looking down? What, do, you know, what is her disposition? What body? And it's, this is all very, very fun to me. Um, you can probably tell that. Okay, now, here is one of my last illustrations, and it's a picture of Emma Lou. Um... Let me put on my glove again. Again, the glove, as you know, maybe you don't know. Here's I, you, you can buy them a bag of 20 or 30, I, you know, 12 pairs, I think it was. And and uh, then you just take a pair of scissors and you cut off all the fingers except the pinky. Okay, so they're really cheap. And I, I get them dirty. I throw them at everybody. Everybody in the house here knows when they find these little gloves you know, on top of the washing machine, that just means please throw these in the next batch of laundry, okay? So, um, the reason I wear them is to protect the paper. <laughs> Not as some people have suggested in some of my videos, to protect my hand. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just makes me laugh. <laughs> no, it's to protect the paper, <laughs> not to protect my hand from this awful paper. <laughs> you know, that dangerous paper and, and uh, graphite. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> in this view, the heroine of the story is swinging she's crippled as you may remember but so she, she, but she's really good at swinging through vines <laughs> again you have to read the story i didn't write the story i'm just illustrating it and one of her mentors an older woman she's not an old woman but she's older than her is also swinging on a vine and there this this young lady is really at a turning point breaking point in her life and she's very angry and she's venting she's yelling and so on and so on. Got, got it okay so i have to show and again, this is, I think of it, you know, if this, if there were such a thing as a final exam in illustration school, <laughs> this, this, this could be one of the assignments. Okay, here's what you have to do. <laughs> we want you, to, we want to, sh us, we want to see a 16 year old girl, 15, 16 year old girl wearing a big leather hat that wasn't used to be her dad's, swinging on a vine, looking over her shoulder, yelling angrily at the person behind her. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, how do I get myself, <laughs> I say to myself, how do I get myself in these pickles? And by the way, just in case, it, now, I don't know why you're following my, my uh, YouTube. If you're following me because I'm an oil painter, I'm sorry. <laughs> Today, be patient. I'll be back to oil painting this afternoon. Um, if you're following me because of my pen and ink work, well, then you're almost in the right place. This is the sketches I do before I do the pen and ink. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I am what I call a, what, a full service artist. I do everything. I was challenged last week about giving advice to young people. Uh, I, I had said, learn to do many things. And some, a professional, fellow professional came back and said, don't tell them that. They need to focus. I, he's right. He's right. If you're, if you're trying to get a job as, as an illustrator, or if you're trying to be represented in a gallery, in galleries, 
you have to have a style, an identifiable style. But I tell you, I have that. Check. Um, uh, I very much have a style in, in as an illustrator and as an oil painter. Uh, I have a, in fact, and I also have a watercolor style that is uniquely mine. That in a sense, I invented it. You can look up some of my watercolors and see watercolor pencil, so on and so on and so, on and so forth. Um, I have a cartoon style. 30 years ago, I was moderately well-known around America as a cartoonist. As I like to say, you saw some of my cartoons back in the 80s and early 90s. Of course, you didn't know they were mine, but you saw them. Um, I'm not, wasn't really, I told my kids when they were little, I'm really famous, just nobody knows it. <laughs> That's the life of an illustrator, by the way. Um, so I have styles. Um, uh, and I, I'm thankful that I work in many different mediums. It's either because I'm a freaking genius and therefore I can develop all these styles, which is an option, but I don't like that option. I like to think, no, I'm really, sure, I'm gifted, like you're gifted. I'm gifted and I'm old. That makes a difference. And I've pursued excellence and expanding my mind for decades now. Okay, so that's that's my bottom line, I think. Okay, just keep growing. Oh, okay, never mind. Let's get back now to drawing. So I started, I did a little bit of work on her face. Let's zero in so you can see what I'm doing here. Started working on her face. She's yelling, swinging on a vine, yelling, hanging on a vine. And, and then I come down her neck to her shoulders and I kind of go, that's my brain bogging down. Okay, so let's let's do this trick. I, I want you to, I've done it before on 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 my channel, but let's do it again. I want to show you how I walk through the process of working out anatomical issues when I don't have a model. Okay, and again, I, I tell my students all the time, do not draw from memory. Now, I'm telling them that because they're students, and the lazy, the lazy man's way out is to draw out of your head. That's lazy. What you have to remember is you're not building your body of knowledge if you're drawing out of your head. You build your body of knowledge by drawing from life or, hang on just a second. I'm going to run over here and get an, another one of my books. This is how you build your body of knowledge. Are you with me? You build your body of knowledge by looking at things and drawing them. And this is a slight, a slight variation on that. Or, and or, by getting good books by good artists. This is Joseph Shepard Anatomy, a complete guide for artists. And, and, and I, I like to say this anytime I point at one of these books. Now, I have not done this with this book, but I sure would like to someday. And I very, mal, I very well may. You don't get much benefit by looking at these pictures. You get like five per seven, nine percent. I'm making up these numbers. Nine percent benefit by looking at the pictures. You get ninety-five percent benefit by drawing the pictures. So if you have one of these books, your assignment is to is to draw. And I have done that with with a couple of books in my library. I've mentioned that before. I have drawn every single every single image every image in the drawing every image you draw this you draw this you draw this you draw this and if you just take a good book like this and make yourself do that give yourself a year right to you young pe young people uh well if you're an art major don't give yourself a semester but to you young people a year seems like a long time but to us old people a year goes by like that and uh, if you if you will draw again, this is only of course if you're going to be an artist who incorporates it does figurative work, or if you're an illustrator like I am, then uh, uh, this is how you build up your 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 memory banks. I kind of like the fact that this guy includes very rough drawings that frankly aren't very good. You know, this is not fantastic draftsmanship. But there's kind of a good thing about that. Um, he's suggesting to you the issue here is not draftsmanship. The issue is learning anatomy. And then you turn the page and he says, okay, here's my draftsmanship. Here's where I show off as a, as a, as a drawer. And I, I kind of like that. Again, I mean, good grief. You really have to draw this bone? Well, 
if you, I, I, I've already mentioned him once this morning. If you want to be as good as Proco, <laughs> Proco, you owe me, dude. Somebody tell Proco that there's this guy over here, Dan Nelson, saying all kinds of good things about him, would you? Um, and again, he, I just found him on, on YouTube. Really high production. Not like me. I'm low quality. <laughs> as we all know, tragically, he does really high quality production. And yeah, I'm I'm a little bit envious, but <laughs> we'll leave that there. Is it, isn't this amazing? This is good stuff. So there you go. So that's what I mean. This is how you build your brain. This is how your art brain gets bigger. There is no shortcut. Now, if you're an artist, this sounds like fun to you. It's a little bit monotonous, you know, sure. A little bit monotonous. Man, I really would like to draw through this entire book. I really would. Um, he does a very good job of separating. What is this now? the head and neck okay okay so that's how you get better by drawing books and by drawing uh people so here i am i have to draw a young girl leather hat head turned angry face swinging from a vine <laughs> and again sorry that just makes me laugh <laughs> it's like who makes this stuff up so how do you how do you how do you do it? One way is you can just start drawing. You just say, well, you know, I think this arm would be somewhere about here, and I think this arm would be somewhere like oh no, it'd be a little bit straighter than that, and so on. So you can just start drawing and then hoping you're you're close, right? And then her torso. Let me see which way is is her back? Is is she going to arch her back or is she going to be a little bit hunched? Uh, strong girl I think she's gonna arch her back okay okay that's one way to do it I'm not gonna pursue that any further here's another way to do it and again of course I have the advantage of this wonderful tool called the light box a light table so I turn on the light turn the page over and here's what I begin doing and again you've seen me do this before we're gonna start by reducing the human figure to for me my most fundamental uh, uh, diagram uh, system. This is it's it, now this this book doesn't do this, but um, uh, George Bridgman. This comes more from George Bridgman and from this guy right here. So it's a combination of George Bridgman and this. Now there there's some really good things about these these models, right? Turn it off so you see your front light. There's some really good things about these models. You can get proportion right, like how big is the head compared to the width of the torso and the arms and the legs and so forth. That's what these are good for. What they are not good for is this, see this, the ball of the shoulder here? This ball, because this wood cannot be, this piece of wood, it's impossible to have it subsumed into this piece of wood. But if you want this to be actually more like the deltoid and shoulder, it would be partly in let me draw it for you over here if i were if it were real then that ball that sphere would be partly subsumed into the shoulder joint i don't know if you can see that or not but now nah, that's not a very good drawing sign but i'm trying to show that it's meshed in but of course if you mesh it in then in wood or plastic you have to carve this out and then that gets weird anyway so make the adjustments mentally uh and uh, here's then how I begin drawing. Uh, if the neck is there, we're looking up at this girl. This is very much a low view. She's above us, which to me makes sense. There's that, that ball of the shoulder I was just talking about a minute ago. And I just happen to know if this is the size of her head, then this is the size of her uh, upper arm. And then this is the length, I should say length, of her, and then this is the length of her lower. How do I know that? But 30 years of looking at this thing has made it, and drawing, tens, you know, 10,000 um, images has, has taught me what these, what these lengths are. This, this part right here is foreshortened, and this is her other arm, so the vine is coming like this. Um... Her head is turned, her hip. Now, again, let me let me do a, a separate drawing. Again, I've done this many times, so forgive me if this is too repetitious for you. 
<clears throat> I'll come back to this in a minute, but let me show you my most fundamental human structure. Okay, this is George Bridgman, 1920s, Art, Art Student League of, of New York. There's a human body, neck, spine, and then we adjust that slightly. We make it a little bit more realistic by tapering. So you start real simple by adding shoulder structure, by taking this box right here and tilting it toward you. This is just one among many, 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 many ways to learn the human physique. It's my favorite way. I learned it, you know, 10 or 20 years ago or 30. I don't remember. No, not 30. Yeah, sometime in the last 15 or maybe 20 years. Uh, when we view this from the side, then it looks like this. Right triangle. Let me raise this up a little bit. Uh, and tilted. Okay. Now, again, I don't have time to teach this at length, but this, this triangle right here is important. Gives a, a general close swoop to the neck. This tilt is right here. Gives the arch of the spine, the, the top side of the the uh, hip that from behind that, that you know that angle very important and and so forth and then when so when you view let's view uh, this figure from above and and a um, so then you'll see where I'm getting this from so again this is my without getting really fancy without getting all involved in all the anatomy and the bones this just this helps me get the the skeleton in the right position. And again, this has been modified. It started out as a square, then it turns it deeper in the edges and so on and so on and so forth. So, and I'm not walking you through all that. And the shoulders are here. This arm is here. See this, this extreme geometrification, <laughs> can I make up that word? Turning the human anatomy into blocks really, really, really helps get um, perspective correct because you know everybody knows you can you can draw a cube in perspective right and because but it's a lot harder to draw a peanut in perspective right because a peanut doesn't have any sharp edges can be done but it's a lot more of an intellectual exercise doing a peanut in perspective than uh, uh, a dice a, a die right a dice so this this is I'm turning the human being away from the organic shapes into uh, geometric shapes, and that really helps get things lined up. And then again, so I'm seeing through these these images. I'm seeing them as clear plastic or clear glass cubes, so that I can see what's going on on the far side of them. So like this, if this was clear, this is this is the far side of this uh, person's chest box, cavity, chest, uh, torso. Okay, so this is, I can do this, sort of, so to speak, in my sleep, because I've done it so many times, I've taught it so many times. Um, so that's what I'm relying on now to get her anatomy correct. Now, if, so we're looking up at the bottom side of her rib cage. I don't think, you can hardly see it here. But if, if this is her rib cage right here, we're looking up, then her spine comes down here, and her hips. See the the hip. What a, a big part of um, George Bridgman's teaching is that th these three blocks: the head, the the uh, rib cage, and the hips. Did I say it? head, rib cage, hips? They're like blocks. They do not morph. They do not twist or turn in any way. Now everything around it. In our, in our physique, in our anatomy, twists and turns and so forth. The spine, extremely flexible and so on. And the shoulders, the, the superstructure on top of the shoulders moves a lot. But these three blocks do not morph. So you can use them as, literally, as building blocks. So I'm thinking um, if, if uh, this is her rib cage, then this is her hip. By the way, the, sh the shape, the, the simple shape of the hip is sort of like like this. I'm not sure what shape that is. Are you saying if, and if we could see through it, if it was transparent, it would be sort of like this. It's sort of like a, a cement block that, that is tapered on all four sides. And then, of course, to make it more realistic, we round it off. Um, we round off the back and so on and so forth. 
Um, so, uh, I'm not sure I've got this hip going the right way, though. If her head's going this way, no, let me, I'm going to change that. So again, this is the this is the internal dialogue that goes on when you guys aren't looking. <laughs> when you guys aren't looking, um, this is this is the kind of work that I am doing. I'm thinking anatomically again, the, and this is just one system. There are many, many, many. A lot of uh, the hip unit is the most sophisticated shape like another you know the and, and the next most you know common is to actually draw the hip bone and then the um the femur that goes into it and so on and so on and so on and so forth so you know i'm pretty aware of skeletal skeletal structure and how it fits in this but this is too complicated way too much information for this point and i may come to that later but right now i just i understand that this fits that this skeleton fits inside here's here's her spine going up the back i don't know if you can see this or not here this point right here is a good indicator of the outside of the femur this corner right here is a really good uh indicator of the arch i just it just flew out of my mind it'll come to me in a minute but this real distinctive uh when we put our hands on our hips we we put our hands here we can feel this um arch and for some reason at the moment the, the anatomical name of that is flying out of my brain it doesn't matter at least that i got the image right okay so i've just switched her hips from going this way now to going this way uh, generally speaking i think you know this the human anatomy goes in an s if the head goes this way the torso goes this way and the hips go that way and once you see that drawn you go oh yeah that is kind of what happens that's what happens to human anatomy so learn learn the s of 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 anatomy if the head goes one way then the chest goes the other and the hips go the third okay so start you can start by drawing an s do you see do you see how that looks like a, a looks kind of like a woman to me um though it's hard to tell um but a woman you know in very much an expressive uh let's let's give her hair and give her breasts so that now we have an idea that that's a woman will make her hips slightly larger and so forth. So, did you see that, how that S? Okay, I'm, I'm digressing. So here, now we have an S. Uh, and if her hips are going that way, then this represents uh, where her... It sort of represents these balls right here, but they're way too small. And they need to be subsumed halfway into this hip unit again do you know the word subsumed that means when two things mesh together which can't happen if they're made out of hard stuff um so if arm arm i've already dealt this is the second time i by the way i've done an illustration for this book of this girl swinging on a vine so i've already thought uh, uh typically when a person swings on a vine unless you're tarzan and you have muscles of steel you typically aid the process by putting the vine between your legs. You hold the vine uh, with your legs. And again, how do I know that? Because um, I've climbed plenty of ropes in my lifetime. Not, not a lot of vines, but climbed a lot of ropes. And you use your legs. Typically, you usually put it between your ankles right there. And, and it's this. So anyway, are you with me? So now I'm looking at that and say, well... You know, or would this leg be up a little higher? And now we're foreshortening and we're seeing latitudinal lines. I used the wrong word yesterday for a while. To, to see foreshortening, to indicate foreshortening, it helps to have latitudinal lines. That would put this, this foot up higher like this. Yeah, I think I like actually like that better. Okay, now this is a great big mess. Are you with me? So what do we do? Well, typically we turn it over. Here's... By the way, one of the things we can do, because we got a light table and I'm working on translucent paper. I am going to, yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to erase. I, I thought I might get by without erasing this, but I don't think I'm going to. So forget the second piece of paper. Change my mind for the moment. There you go. Can you see that? So now I've got this figure. 
blocked, the figure blocks worked out. So what happens now if I come in here, obviously this is a chin, There's here's the, the longitudinal line of the face and the eyes, ear, mouth here, eyes here, forehead here, crown of head, temple, edge of temple, etc., etc., right? Neck, very, very prominent here. Neck. Uh, this is, I'm pointing, I'm pointing at myself. Um, this, there's a name for this. Again, I'm, I'm forgetting it. The, the, the gap right there between the, uh, you know, underneath your Adam's apple. Um, that's what that is. So th this clavicle, this collarbone is going up like this. This one's going over like this. I don't think I have quite enough space there. So I'm, I'm moving with every drawing. That, and this is very foreshortened here. A very foreshortened view of this upper arm. Elbow. How do we see the elbow? Um, all of these things. Let me let me grab another piece of paper here just for a minute. Or should I do it? No, I can do it over here. Hang on just a second. Um, in the course of doing your anatomical studies, little by little by little, you learn, for instance, that a diamond is a good, a good shortcut for an elbow. Because this, this, these two bones right here and this bone right here, from several views, actually can be well represented by, a, so this is like an upper arm. Here, here's a hand down here. You with me? So a diamond. And again, you just learn these shortcuts. Uh, the, uh, the knee, quickly represented by um, whatever, two, two buckets, one inside the other. Here's the knee. Uh, goes like this, um, and so on. That's a little bit high. You know, these, these little quick little shortcuts that can be refined. Um, you get this stuff from all these good books that are out there, and nowadays good videos as well. Okay, back to the figure then. Um, there's the diamond of her elbow. It's just a quick, shorthand way because I've got a lot of anatomy yet to work out, as you can see. Okay, this shoulder goes way up here. By the way, since I'm, I'm talking more about anatomy than I than I expected to, but real quickly, um, when it comes to shoulders, what is the position of the shoulder? That's a really good question. If you're doing really overly simple anatomy, it's easy to say something like, well, here's the head and here's the neck and Here's the shoulders. The shoulders are right here. Okay, yeah? Is that where shoulders are? Watch this. <laughs> Where's the shoulder now? My shoulder is pressed smack dab against my ear. This is the amazing thing about shoulders. It's, of course, in, in the back, I've got a shoulder blade that is sliding under my skin, sliding between muscles. You know, my shoulder blade literally sliding between tissues. And in the front, I've got this clavicle collarbone that works just like this, like a lever. So it lets my shoulder go all the way up like this. So, you know, again, you can't just, you can't just learn anatomy of, as I say often, you can't just learn how to draw um, the guards at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Are you with me? There's the guard at Buckingham Palace. Now, the, you, you got to start there because you have to know, you know, how long, how long are, all these things, but unless you're drawing a guard at Buckingham Palace, <laughs> I get that. By the way, this is funny. I get that from Winnie the Pooh, but never mind. That's another story from my childhood. Um, it could be the at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Washington D.C. Right? It could be anywhere. But unless you're drawing him, you better learn how to do some some uh, uh, energetic motions. And then we are back to this letter S. Stuff. Okay. So here's her shoulder, not quite pressed against her ear because her head's turned to the side, right? But her shoulder is way, this shoulder is way up high. And then that starts this part of her arm again. Diamond is a good shortcut for uh, the, the bones in the uh, elbow and then her hand. And again, usually better to draw the hand as a single unit and then add fingers later than trying to draw fingers, especially at this point, okay? So here, by the way, here's, we can't see it from here, but here's her diaphragmatic arch. Her breasts would be here just to help sometimes, 
you know, draw more anatomy than you need so that they, it becomes markers. Okay, now down to her hip. Um, if I may, real quickly, I'm, I'm, boy, I'm, I'm doing a lot more anatomical teaching today than I expected to, but that's all right. Um, the hips. Um, let me go back to this, this sim simple, um, I'm sorry, doing it upside down. This simple thing. This is one way to imagine the hips. Okay, it's just one of many. Uh, Proco does it a very different diagram, and that's okay. So of course it goes without saying to round all these corners off. Um, once you've done that, um, then again viewing we're viewing we're looking down at these hips, and we're they're made out. This diagram is made out of glass, so we can see through it. Okay, so if we were to draw the other the far side, it's like that. And here are, is where the, the legs, the thighs, intersect with this unit. Um, and that, that, that helps get me the position, the placement of the legs. Um, let me draw this same diagram, sort of, from, the, from a three-quarters angle from the side. Okay, so again, there's my, that's my shortcut for hips. And again, I get this mostly from George Bridgman, so this is as good as any. And then we shave off this, shave off this, and so on and so forth. What the one the one I want to show you is that this this intersection right here is a pretty good um, diagram. And again, this is just my real quick again illustration of a hip bone. It's this arch right here corresponds to that corner right there, and this point right here corresponds to the outside of the femur. Again, I'm getting more into anatomy than I expected. <coughs> can I stand up here? Yeah, I can. Hey, just for a minute. By the way, <laughs> yes, this is a bed in my studio. <laughs> our, our, our house is a virtual menagerie these days. Um, not only do we have our kids and their kids, a family of six, living with us. We have my mother-in-law living with us. So she's got our bedroom, and my wife and I are camping out in my studio. It's a zoo. Anyway, we love it. We love them all. Uh, but I want to talk about hips. Uh, funny thing about the English language, we use one word to refer to two completely different parts of the anatomy. I don't know if you know, and this is the kind of thing an artist needs to get straight in their mind. When I say to you, put your hands on your hips, what do you do? You go like this. Unless, by the way, you're a woman. I don't know if you know this. If you're a woman, you're more likely to go like this. Men go like this. Women go like this. Notice. Very rarely do you see a man thumbs forward. Very often you see a woman thumbs forward. So we're made differently. Our, our skeletons and muscles actually behave differently. Okay, so when you say put your hands on your hips, that's what we do. My hands are on my hips. But if we're uh, doing the hokey pokey and turn yourself around or we're dancing and we're, we're hip bumping or... If a woman's eat, eat, woman, I'm picking on women, you know what I mean, because it's more typical. Woman's eating a donut or a bagel. She says, this is going to go straight to my hips. Listen to this. She is not at all talking about this part of her anatomy. Say to a woman, put your hands on her hips. She puts her hands here. You say to a woman, are you worried about your hips? She's not talking. She's talking about this. Two com they're completely different bones, by the way. This is actually the hip bone, and again, this arch that you can feel. You can see it's real prominent when you, you know, with a shirt off, which I will spare you. <laughs> um, that's part of the hip bone. This is not the hip bones at all. This that I'm slapping right now, what you, when you're kids, you know, you're dancing, you bump each other. What are you bumping each other with? Or what does a woman say? This can go straight to my hips. She's not talking about this. She's talking about this. Com one word, two completely different parts of the anatomy. Fascinating. Um, okay, back to back to drawing then. <laughs> I don't know if you guys wanted to hear this or not, but it's what you're getting. Um, when we when we when we play bumper cars with our hips, what we're actually bumping is the top of our femur, F-E-M-U-R, the largest bone in the human body, which is the thigh bone. The bone that goes from our hips down to our knee, the femur, and the femur. I've exaggerated here. I'm over. Uh, what was the word I used a little while ago? I'm over geometrifying, <laughs> over geometrifying the human anatomy to make it simple. But basically, here is 
here is a femur. It's the number if it's the number seven, unless we're looking at the other one. Then it's the up the number seven in reverse. Okay, and this this part right here, this is what we bump against our friends when we're being silly teenagers. I'm picking on teenagers. You know what I mean? This when we slap the side of our hips, we're actually slapping the femur. So um, to be again overly simplistic. When you're drawing hips from the front, let's do woman's hips. Bump number one, bump number two. Are you with me? Here's here's the belly button. We're looking here's the here's the diaphragmatic arch. Here's her rib cage. It's up here. Breasts are up here. And here's her waist. Bump number one and bump number two. Why? What? What are we looking at? What we're looking at here, bump number one is this hip bone, the hip bone right here, and, and this arch. That's bump number one. Bump number two down here is the top of the femur. Okay? So again, just uh, all these little things, you just learn them little by little uh, by drawing real figures and by looking at anatomy books again. You know, sort of like, like this one. My favorites, by the way, I talk about all the time, are Jack Ham, H-A-M-M, -M, Drawing the Head and Figure, uh, and uh, Andrew Loomis. Okay, so back to my figure. See, I, I, part of the reason I thought about, did all that, those shenanigans, is here's, here's a hip. And I'm thinking, okay, let's see. Um, uh, and how, again, how do I know where to draw? Because I, I did the geometrical figure over here that and that, that's what I'm copying not that's what I'm using as a reference and um, so there's bump number one and bump number two are you with you see what I'm talking about bump number one is the hip bone bump number two is the is the um, femur it goes like that okay so again I'm I'm, 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 I'm and again, there's people that are so much better at this than I am because I'm not a full-time figurative painter. It sounds like fun. Maybe I'll turn into one someday. You never know. Uh, but uh, at the moment, of course, most of my work is landscape. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say this. This is pretty darn good for a landscape painter, don't you think? <laughs> and I'm being facetious, of course, because right now I'm not acting like a landscape painter at all. I'm acting like an illustrator. It is my job to get things like anatomy pretty darn close. So there's an ankle bone. Again, ankle bone well represented by a diamond. Um, knee bone represented by a bucket inside a bucket. Again, these are just real short shorthand to get to you know to get you in the ballpark. And then I've got the vine then uh, going between her legs up to this hand, from this hand up to this hand, and so forth. Now let's turn this off and see how I'm doing. Hmm. Not bad. She's, she's going to be wearing a hat and we're looking up at her. So we're seeing the hat from underneath and she's got this, she has long flowing brunette hair. So what do I do? Where do I go from there? All right, well, you see the pattern? Now I can still change my mind. I can say, nah, in fact, I am going to change my mind slightly. I'm going to say I'm going to make this knee, this leg, come even higher than I did a minute ago, and so then this twists around this way. Okay, so that's becoming such a mess you can hardly see it. So again, the tool I'm using is a graphite lead holder. I, this is a new tool, new toy to me. Love it. I'm, I'm hooked for life on this. I like it because it's a fat line. When you when you use a pencil like this that makes real skinny lines. You're too in too much danger of too much detail, uh, but this fat thing keeps you keeps you keeps you loose. Whew. Now it might be time to go to a clean piece of paper. So let's see. After I've done all these all these crazy diagrams, for you guys. See when I get real real rich, <laughs> I'm going to hire an assistant to do this erasing for me. <laughs> Here, bud. <laughs> Here, Bubba, <laughs> would you please erase this for me? Sure thing, boss. <laughs> uh, I say that all the time when I'm painting. When I'm a have really rich, I can pay somebody to set up my easel and <laughs> clean my brushes for me. Oh, man. By the way, here's a tool that I actually do use quite a bit. Um, 
Of course, my floor is a mess. Yes, it is. It's got, it's got eraser crumbs all over it. Um, now, let me see if I want to go to a clean piece of paper. Again, because, let's see. Yeah, I do. So, you with me? So, this is sketch number three now. And now I'm looking, I have clean, I have clean uh, view of of this drawing because I'm seeing a mirror image of it. So every time you turn it over, you go, oh, wow. And I'm using here removable scotch tape. I use not ordinary scotch tape, but the kind that can be taken off. And I'm to the point now that I don't think I need to do any more blocks of the human anatomy. I'm close enough. I can just start making edits and changes. So we're looking up her nose. We're looking up at her mouth. We're looking up at her chin. We're looking up at her ear. Are you with me? All these things, is, you have to keep the, the anatomy in mind all the time. Oh, ears wrong place. Move it over. And, of course, I'm, I'm going to put, she's not going to be swinging naked. <laughs> uh, that would be quite the different, quite the different story. <laughs> oh, man. No, she's going to be quite fully clothed. But of course, you can't draw her clothed because you have to be able to get the anatomy right. So you, you know what I mean? I remember my mom and, and my mom, who I love dearly, and she's still living. She's 92 years old and, and I love her to death. And she's very, very bright and very joyful. 92-year-old joyful woman. I tell you, what an inspiration. I tell her all the time, man, I want to be like you when I'm 92. Um, I remember years ago, because she was a very conservative person. And it was perfectly okay. Hey, Mark, it was perfectly okay to be raised by a conservative mother. It kept, kept me out of a lot of trouble, I think. And, um, okay, so this, I now see this, this hip is, is too, too pronounced, too far up. No, no problem. Shorten a little bit. And sometimes I'll just draw arbitrary, like I did up here. I'm just drawing arbitrary latitudinal lines. I talked about that yesterday to help me quickly read that as a foreshortened limb. Okay. Um, anyway, my mom, uh, who is a, you, you could say she was puritanical. She was very conservative. You know, that we, we were a very conservative family of talking about, and by the way, I'm using puritanic, uh, Puritan in the way the conventional culture, I'm enough of a historian to know that, that his Puritans actually get a very bad rap. They were not all prudes. They were not prudes as they are have the reputation of being. But be that as it may, I'm just using it in the common, common parlance right now. But my mom was very conservative about body and sexual things. But even she said, I remember when she was talking about artists, I was a teenager, and she, she, she talked about some artists who, who you could tell they had never drawn, quote, the body beautiful. In other words, they'd never done nude figure studies because they, they, even though they were doing drawings of people clothed, the bodies were not very good. So you have to be able to draw nudes in order to be able to draw clothes. <laughs> Making up more words. Nudes, that means person with no clothing. What do you call a person with clothing on? Clothes. <laughs> anyway, so even my puritanical conservative mom had to admit... <laughs> And she was a nurse, by the way, so, you know, that she had that whole doctor medical thing going on. Um, if you're a doctor, you, you know, you have to deal with naked people. And that, that, that's not a bad comparison for the, the art world. Um, so I'm one step closer to anatomy. And, of course, this is a clean piece of paper, so I don't have, don't have to erase. So that, I, that was sketch number, by the way, let's count. I had sketch number one, two three, and this coming up would be number four, sketch number four. Now, there's some things about it I'm not crazy about. I, I'm going to put, I'm going to give her more strength in this arm than, than I've given her, which means, in other words, a, a weak person, when they're hanging from anything, their, their arms go straight, right? Both shoulders are plastered against their ears because they don't have the strength to do a pull-up, so to speak. And that's why I, that was my first inclination, but I'm thinking, and by the way, I've already talked about, this girl is pretty athletic because she has a, a deformed a foot. So she, she's compensated. She's pretty, has some pretty decent upper body strength 
because she's had to learn to cope with her uh, bum leg. She watch, walks at this stage in the story, she walks with a crutch, a series of crutches as she grows older, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull her arm down and say, now nah, let's, let's give her more upper body strength than, than my first inclination. And I've got the vine now goes right between her legs and comes out between her ankles, actually between her calves and so on and so forth. That's, I've, I've, I've spent way, way more time than I intended. Um, but I hope, I hope there's some art student watching me again to see this is what artists go through. This is the part that, you know, you don't see most of the time. And when an artist looks like they just whip out stuff um, without any paint effort, uh, you know, striving, this is all the stuff that you're missing. So that's drawing number four. And when I turn it over this next time, I'm going to begin putting clothes on her. Does that make sense? Uh, but I don't think you need to watch me do that. I'm, I've, I've see, think I've taken this broadcast to its logical end. <laughs> uh, I will just tell you that what I'm going to do on this side of this piece of paper is, is drawing number five. And it'll be stuff like, okay, what kind of clothing? What is she wearing? She's typically she wears loose fitting. She's a she's a backwoods girl, so she typically wears you know just a loose fitting t-shirt, oversized t-shirt above and um, kind of nondescript pants below. And so pretty easy putting clothes on her. And um, then, then we begin, okay, so where's this? Where's this bone in her wrist? Yeah, right about there, which gives a line about there. And again, there's, I'm, I'm recognizing that the diamond shape in her elbow gives us a point right there and a point right there so on and so on and so forth. Now her mouth is not open. She's yelling at the woman behind her. She's angry and she's yelling. And uh, there, there's a little bit of an insight into the life of an illustrator. I hope that was fun. Um, I hope it was instructive, especially for any of you who are uh, emerging artists. Sure, learn something from me, then go over and watch Proko. <laughs> hey, Russian friend. I will put that in translator later and find out what you're saying. That'll be fun. Thank you. So good to have you on board. Uh, so go watch Proko and you'll learn a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, I'm a big believer in drinking from many streams. I think I teach you some good stuff, but he teaches you other good stuff. And there's a number of other people. Stay away from the people that aren't so good, <laughs> which will remain. I will not name them today. Maybe on another day when I'm more ornery, I might name them, <laughs> but I won't today. Let's, let's see. I'm almost, I'm almost finished this drawing. So let me go ahead and finish this while, while you're still with me. Again, with each layer, I get a little bit more anatomically correct. And, and of course, in this case, I get a little bit more clothing correct. There are also tricks for learning how to do wrinkles in clothing and so on and so forth. But frankly, if I just add some shading to this, this is probably good enough for me to show to my client. In other words, I'll, I'll do the other figure and I'll do the same thing, not perhaps quite as involved because she's further away, so not as much detail. <clears throat> but this probably gives me, and of course the shading definitely helps with the, the, the visualizing this character. Thank you very much. Thank you for the translation. You are very welcome. Uh, Pafa, is, that, is it? Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. I don't know Russian. I know a little bit of Greek, and, and I know that the Greek, that's, that's how I try to read Russian, is by bringing in my Greek knowledge a little bit. So that, that's probably enough of a sketch, as I said, to show my client. It's enough for him to say, yep, I like it, or, well, how about try this? You know what I mean? And by the way, it's a good idea not to spend too many hours. You saw how many, well, I did that in about half an hour, right? 
that's about that's a reasonable amount of time because my my client might come back and say well you know i was thinking it ought to be more blank that is certainly the client's prerogative right is to say things like that let me make by the way here's a really good tool this is a hello mike bart hello everyone thanks for thanks for saying hi um here's a good tool a eraser pencil alexei Papa's, you, oh, good. I was pretty close. Papa, wasn't I? <laughs> Thank you, Alexei. And I presume you're from Russia, right? What part of Russia? It's a big country. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't need to tell you that, do I? <laughs> the largest country in the world, in fact, right? 11 time zones. That's what I, by the way, you Americans, I don't know. I remember hearing that years ago. We have four time zones in the United States. Do you know Russia covers 11 time zones? That means it wraps almost halfway around the world. Uh, I'm so glad Russians are our friends now. <laughs> I'm one of those who believes Russians are our friends. <laughs> I don't think they're trying to kill us. I really don't. I do have an interesting grip, don't I? Thank you. It's usually, usually like this, right, for my sketching. And then I do this for the, for the details. Thanks for noticing, Alexei. Okay. So that, that's been fun. Oh, Finland. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for correcting me. Oh, I've never been to Finland. I've been to Sweden, been to Denmark, been close to Finland, been to Bornholm, an island in the Baltic, and, and probably the most, the most fascinating and exotic place I've ever been in my life is in the island of Bornholm in the, in the Baltic Sea. Um, wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Good to have you on board. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, I, I hope that was interesting. So you see how this is drawing number five. Take me, took me five sketches to go from this kind of thing to a fairly believable figure. And again, when I look at it with fresh eyes, you know, in an hour or two, I might go, oh, wait a minute. Let's make some, let me make some changes there. Okay. Thanks, guys. It's been fun having you. I, I hope it was enjoyable for you. <laughs> and uh, maybe I'll do another one today. T today, Later on today, I'll be downstairs painting, oil painting, which is my full-time job. This is illustrations, a good, fun part-time job.